Good evening and welcome to another edition of uh, the Set Free Summit. Could you please turn my microphone down a little bit? And uh, glad uh, you're here this evening. Um, this evening uh, we have a couple of uh, powerful presentations. Uh, one is by James Pello, who's going to be sharing his journey and uh, his experience of how to experience freedom. Uh, and I think uh, you'll be very blessed by that message uh, this evening. And also, we are so blessed to have uh, Janice McKenzie, who is a uh, professor and uh, also a scientist, as she's going to be sharing about how to find uh, victory, especially in the kind of the uh, nuts and bolts of our uh, physical life. And, and, so, uh, and so we are so glad uh, that they have uh, come this evening. Uh, we are so blessed uh, that night by night, uh, and I, I hope that you've been blessed as well. Uh, this evening, uh, we are going to be talking uh, about uh, some of our follow-up programs because, again, many times uh, when you have a seminar, that's uh, it's all exciting, it's all very good uh, while you're listening to it, but then after the uh, lights go out and uh, people leave, uh, much of that information gets kind of uh, thrown by the wayside, and so. Uh, today, I just want to uh, just highlight again uh, the uh, next step option. Uh, Bob was, if we can show that up on our screens here. Um, so this is uh, what Bob was talking about a couple nights ago, uh, next step. Uh, and it's going to be on Thursday, uh, February the 1st. Uh, and it's going to be taking place at Sunbridge. And so uh, contact Bob uh, and... Uh, and if you're interested in being part of that, uh, we also have a women's group. Uh, the women's group is going to be um, happening on uh, or taking place on Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m. And again, it's, uh, the location is to be determined, but uh, Barbara Froney, and Barbara is going to be sharing a song at the end, and so uh, you can contact Barbara Froney directly after the program tonight, and uh, she can give you uh, get your contact information and make sure that uh, you can be a part of that uh, women's group. Then there's going to be uh, something called the Bondage Breakers. I don't know, uh, some of you may have read a book by Neil Anderson uh, called The Bondage Breaker, and it's uh, a book that's uh, powerful, very powerful, uh, helping people to uh, break harmful habits, negative thinking, and uh, irrational feelings. Uh, which leads to sinful behavior. I'm going to be leading that group, and so uh, you can talk to me afterward. It's going to be on Wednesdays, 6 p.m., and, uh, and we're probably going to be hosting it out of uh, a house, probably my own. Anyways, so come talk to me afterwards uh, if you'd like to be a part of that. And then uh, finally, the fourth option is our health challenge. It's a six-week health li and lifestyle challenge, uh, it's kind of a, a, a fun way to uh, inspire one another to better living. And so uh, uh, we're going to be, uh, it's, it's kind of, if, if you remember last year, um, if those of you who may have been involved with the F5 challenge, well, it's kind of similar, but uh, it's a little bit more comprehensive. And so uh, this is going to be uh, starting on Monday, January the 29th. And so uh, jo talk to uh, John and Lana Ash, and uh, there's their contact information there. So uh, all of this information can be found at the uh, setfreesummit.com slash challenge uh, webpage. I hope that uh, you uh, have been going to that because we're uh, updating that page uh, almost daily uh, with uh, videos and uh, information and resources for you to take advantage so again, uh, if you have any questions, uh, if you're watching this online, you can text 509-526-0112. And that information, uh, you can find, uh, a connect with somebody uh, through that phone line. So thank you again for coming out tonight. And at this point in time, I, I'm going to invite uh, James Pello to come forward. Again, night by night, we are highlighting different people who have had an experience of being set free. And we've, uh, we've had a number of uh, different presentations, powerful presentations, 
uh, of those that were in uh, into drugs and alcohol and in very dark places of their life. Well, tonight, uh, James Pello has agreed to come and to share his journey. It's a little bit different. <laughs> and so this evening, be, of course, before we get into the story, we're going to bow our heads and uh, have a prayer that God would anoint this message. Father in heaven, I pray for James as he is sharing from his heart because Each person's story is a unique experience of what God is doing in their life. And so, Father, tonight I'm praying for James that you would help him as he relays his experience of what was it like to uh, be caught in the chains that Satan uh, bound him with, and then what was it like to have Jesus come along and to break those chains. So, thank you again for what you've done in James Pillow's life. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So James, uh, it, it's kind of strange because both of our names are James, and you know when we call each other, it's like, uh, hi James, this is James. You know, it sounds a little strange, and those of you who have, you know, who've called uh, somebody with your own name, it's, it's, you, you understand what I'm saying. So tonight, uh, James, take us back to your life. The, the first thing we want to know is kind of where, where, what was your growing up experience? Paint that picture for us. All right. Well, you know, I think each one of our stories is a little bit different, and mine is certainly different. But, you know, it's normal to me. It feels like just my story. And each one of you have a story, and, you know, you might think, I don't have a story. It's not really a big deal. And that's what I feel like sometimes. And yet, you know, it's just because it's my story, and I'm so used to it, it feels normal, right? So you've got a story to tell as well, and I'd love to hear yours. But I started out, and uh, my, my home was a right down the middle of the road, typical Adventist Christian home. My parents were not necessarily conservative, not necessarily on the liberal side, just kind of right down the middle, typical traditional Adventist home. And it was a good home. I appreciated my parents in a lot of ways. Uh, we had our challenges. There was a lot of uh, emotional challenges. My parents both grew up in fairly challenged environments. They grew up um, uh, in in some darkness of their own. And so they brought what they could to our family. And there were challenges. Uh, There was a lot of kind of backbiting. There was a lot of put downs, a lot of emotional kinds of abuse that went on there. But it was just normal. And uh, so I would say that I had a really good childhood in a lot of ways. I think of probably some of the things that were fantastic about my childhood that I really appreciated. My dad, when I was about 11, went on to take optometry. He'd been an electrical engineer prior to that, and he decided to change careers. And so as he was going through his schooling, he was home a lot. And he was busy, but he was always eager to have me come walking, wandering in through into his office there and sit on his lap. I was probably 8 to 11, kind of in that range. And he would tell me about all kinds of things. He would tell me about physics and about math and about science and about God. And we talked deeply about all kinds of things. And it was a very formative time in my childhood. I really appreciated those conversations. So having a good relationship with yeah. your father, and, and obviously, you know, our, our earthly relationship with our father makes a big difference because yes, we project uh, uh, the picture of our earthly father upon our heavenly father. And so having that, yes, there were challenges. Yeah. There, were, there were challenges, and in, 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 in while there's no perfect parents, and I, I, I will raise my hand and say I am not a perfect parent. <laughs> and, uh, and, but the reality is that... Uh, you know, your parents uh, had some challenges, like all parents do, yeah. but, uh, but, they, but your father was trying to be a dad and trying to, you know, trying to help his son, you know, learn about life. He did. What a great opportunity, yeah. Yes, and I appreciated a lot of what I learned there. Um, my parents tried to kind of shelter us to some degree. They made the decision early on that we weren't going to have a television in our home, for example. Mm-hmm. And we had very strong music uh, sensitivities, I should say. And so, you know, I remember as a kid, you know, we'd be driving along in the car and the, and the radio would come on to something that maybe wasn't appropriate. 
in their mind, and so we, we knew it had crossed the line and we were quick to turn it off, you know, and everybody would kind of race to, oh, let's turn it off, you know, that's mm -hmm. bad music. Mm -hmm. So we had kind of all developed this sense of what the, this, this, this line was that our parents had kind of drawn in the sand for us there. Okay, so establishing those, those, those uh, foundational stones and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, as you were going, uh, growing up and going to school, what was that like? Yeah, so because of a lot of the emotional abuse that was going on in the home, I didn't have a solid foundation on how to have good friendships. And so I was kind of the brunt of a lot of jokes. I was kind of that guy, I was kind of the nerdy guy, I was interested in electronics and math and these kinds of things. And I didn't know how to play football and I was the nerd. And so I, got, I was kind of the brunt of a lot of jokes. And so I kind of grew up socially with this foundation of looking for where I fit in. Uh, what's my place in life? Kind of not knowing the answer to that question. So that kind of laid the foundation. That was probably the door that Satan used to kind of start getting access. Right, isolating, isolating. You feel like, you know, I, I, I don't really feel like I fit in. Right. And uh, I don't know quite who I am. I don't yeah. fit, really fit into any picture. You know, everyone seems perfect, but, you <laughs> know. But, but, and then there's me, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So now start to walk us through this process because, again, the devil's been at his craft for over 6,000 years, and, uh, and he watches, he watches each one of us, and he's looking for ways, avenues, by which he can get us caught in his traps. What were some of those as early on that you see, as you look back in your life, mm -hmm. uh, to see how Satan was able to effectively... Uh, shoot his, you know, shoot his, his uh, uh, attacks at you and yeah. to get you trapped. Yeah, so there were several things that happened. We moved into uh, uh, the little town of Spangle, Washington to, to go to UCA. My mom, well, that was another thing that I forgot to mention. My parents split up when I was about 14. And that was a big hit on, on my life in a lot of ways. You know, there was always this uh, going to dad's house on the weekend and and it was a big deal and there was all the you know He's saying all the bad things about her and she's saying all the bad things about him and you want to get kind of in the middle I don't know probably a lot of you guys have been in that situation Where you're trying to defend both and everybody thinks you're on the other person's side and it was a mess wow. um, So that had a, a real foundation and so we moved into Spangle. I started going to UCA, and we moved right across the street. Can from I put a pause family. on that? Please. UCA stands for what? Upper Columbia Academy. So it's a, it's a small private school there. Uh, it's a Seventh-day Adventist Academy. Just south uh, of, just, of Spokane, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. About 15 miles south of Spokane in Spangle, Washington. It's a pretty wide... Well, actually, Spangle has grown, so... It has. You know, and, <laughs> it, but when I went there, it was just kind of a wide spot in the road, and then there was the academy, and that was pretty well it. But. Yep, yep. A bunch of wheat fields out there, if you've right. been in that area. So, um, so we went... Uh, we were going to UCA there, and the family that lived right across the road from us, we kind of got to know fairly well. And their children were, um, didn't grow up with the same set of standards that we grew up with. And we fit in well and we enjoyed doing, they were a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun. And so I found myself just kind of slipping just a little bit, making small compromises to, to fit into that community. That's what I needed. I wanted community and I started fitting in there. But I would say the real changes in my life started on my junior year. Uh, at the beginning of the year, I started dating this girl. Um, and she had had a lot of challenges in her life as well. You know, the rocks and the holes in our heads. You know the saying. And um, we resonated together on some of those challenges. And she used to listen to this easy listening um, kind of 80s music. And it was well over the line of, as far as what I grew up listening to. But I sat there, you know, and my parents never really explained to me why some of the standards they had were what they were. They just kind of, this is how you should be. You know, this is what you should do. So I'd listen to the music that she was listening to, and I thought, well, it's just talking about daily life. 
you know? And I can resonate with some of the things it's talking about. And yeah, it's got a little bit of a beat to it, but what, what's wrong with that, really, you know? And, um, and so I started to make compromises against what, what I had been trained and raised to believe was right. Hmm. And we all have an understanding of music, and we're all at a different place. And I'm not here to kind of judge anybody's perception of what is good music and bad music and all that. I'm telling my story from what mm -hmm. I was experiencing mm -hmm. at the time. I was compromising very clearly. And so we would sit and listen to this music. And as I started to compromise, I started to listen to, you know, kind of explore around the dial just a little bit. And I found myself really kind of enjoying some of the pop rock of the 80s, for example, and, and really pushing the line more and more. And it didn't take very long to go from having a fairly clear line to having no line at all whatsoever. So this, this path, and, 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 and by the way, I, I resonate with this a lot. And the reason mm. why was because I had a very similar situation, mm. you know, and, and my experience was in eighth grade where uh, one of my friends uh, shared, wasn't a girl, it was a guy, but uh, shared with me uh, Beach Boys, <laughs> you know, and right. for, for me, it, it, well it started with Beach Boys, you know, I get around type thing. <laughs> yeah, I know. You uh, resonate. Yeah. I, I know, but, 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 they, but, but the point is this, is that um, that yeah. was the starting point, but that was not the ending point. Right. And what you're sharing is it started with easy listening, but very quickly because right. you didn't have the principles, the principles no in your mind. Yeah. It, it was just, this is bad. Why? Well, I don't know why. It's just bad. Right. And then all of a sudden you're like, well, I'm listening to this and I, hmm, what's bad about it? Right. And I kind of want to fit in. I kind of like the people I'm hanging out with here that are listening to these kinds of things. I'm finding a little community. We're having a lot of fun. We're going and doing all kinds of things. You know, if this was back, I don't know if the young people cruise now, you know, we'd go down to Spokane and we'd cruise. <laughs> Put the music all cranked up, you know. <laughs> I think some of you have done this. <laughs> sure. And, you know, and I was fitting in. And for me, it felt good all of a sudden mm -hmm. to feel like I was with young people mm -hmm. that were respecting me and treating me like I was a normal human being. So, so now all of a sudden, you know, it's blown wide open. Now you're listening to any and everything. Where did it go from there? Yeah, so um, I had a cousin that was big into heavy metal, and he was pushing the lines way harder than I wanted to. He was drinking and smoking and, and watching all kind of crazy movies and just had really pushed the line, and he kept encouraging me down that road. But I had a, a fairly, I did not want to drink and smoke. I just did not, I just felt like, you know, I, I just didn't want to go there. And so I drew the line there, but he and I would go and listen to his heavy metal together, and, and, and I just felt it was a darkness there. You know, and I never did say, God, I don't want you. I never did close that door. I just kind of put him on pause. And, you know, I was so busy with life, and, you know, I'm going to school, and we're doing things with friends, and I, I didn't have time to just kind of stop and think. And, and experience where this was taking me. And so this was, um, this was a journey that kind of took, oh, probably a year or so to take. And as, as, I, as I was really deeply immersed in this, I started noticing some physical changes in my body. I started noticing that I would startle really easy. For example, if something really startled me, I could just, I would go into panic. And that was not normal for me. That was kind of strange. And I would feel my heart beat like crazy. And, and then it would feel like it would stop. And then I, and, and then I would feel like, oh, it's, am I dying? And I mean, it's all kind of mental things that were going on in my brain that were just not normal, not, not what I would normally experience. And, um, and I felt like there was just a darkness that was descending over my, my, my life. And, and, you know, at the same time, I found this, we didn't have a lot of money. So I found this television in the dumpster. And I 
resurrected it, and I kind of worked at my magic on the thing, got it working. So I had this television in my, it's an old black and white. <laughs> I mean, that was all I had. But I'm sitting there listening to Laverne and Shirley, I think it was, and, I'm, and I've got music on in the background, and I'm sitting there, I'm leaned up against my bed, and I remember this very clearly. I'm sitting there just kind of immersed in this experience. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, I felt this incredibly dark presence just enter the room, just walked in the room. And I remember just bristling. And then all of a sudden, it was just wham, something hit my chest really hard. And I couldn't breathe. I mean, it's pressing me against the bed for everything. I, I, I just couldn't, you know, I could feel the fingers just pressed against my chest. And the first thing that went through my mind was, Lord, help me. And I praise the Lord that that was the first thing that went through my mind. And so I called out to God and I said, Lord, deliver me. I don't know what's going on, but deliver me. And the presence left. A few seconds later, the presence left. And the whole experience probably lasted 10 seconds. And I remember turning off the television and my music and just kind of sitting there going, what just happened? Yeah, major wake up call. Major wake, what just happened? And I sat there for probably 30 seconds, a minute, just kind of going. <laughs> and I kind of shrugged it off and went and turned the TV and the music back on and kind of, well, I don't know what just happened, but it's gone now. Hmm. And I continued on and I kind of just blew it off. And um, then, it, then it happened again. I was laying in bed, I was listening to my music. I'm just, I'm just laying there. And all of a sudden, wham, just pressed me down into the bed. And I couldn't breathe. And I call out to the Lord, and he delivers me again. And I'm so grateful. Happened three times. And I started noticing that I was having heart problems. I just felt something's wrong. And I was telling my mom, I don't know what's going on, but I feel like something's wrong with my heart. I don't know what's going on. And she said, well, let's go check it out. So we went in, and... They hooked me up, a bunch of wires. I carried this little thing for 24 hours on my side, and they took all kind of data, trying to figure out what's going on. Nothing wrong, nothing wrong. So I thought, well, I know what I can do. I can go walking. I, should, I, I can get some exercise. Maybe that'll help me. And so I started walking every night. Well, like I said, we were poor. We didn't have a, I didn't have a Walkman or anything that I could bring my music with me, so it was, just me. And I didn't have very many of those kind of situations. I always had something on. The TV was always on. The music was always on, as loud as I could make it without people complaining. And if I was in the car, wherever, it was always on. I never had that time to just kind of stop and think. But here I am. I'm going out in the evening, and I'm walking. And it took about four nights of just walking and just kind of my thoughts starting to just gel a little bit sense starting to come to my brain just a little bit. And I remember to this day very, very clearly. I, I could tell you where I was at. I'm walking along and I'm realizing I don't have any peace anymore. I don't have, I, I remember what it was like to go to bed and feel like I was resting. I didn't have that anymore. And I remember looking up at the stars. It was a perfect night, cloudless night, looking up at the stars, and, and I just sensed something was there for me. And I says, Lord, if you're up there, I want you. I want what you had for me before. I want to come back. And, you know, not everybody's experience is the same at that moment, but... I had this flood of peace come over me that was so intensely powerful, I could hardly walk the rest of the way. I, I, I was just like floating. I just felt like I wanted to run. I was, there was so much joy that poured into my being at that moment. I just couldn't even comprehend it. Yeah. I couldn't even process what this was. Wow. And so that's, that was the turning point. That was the turning that point. That was the turning point. And in the last couple minutes, kind of talk draw that line forward to today yeah. and how, how has your experience been since that moment uh, where you came back to the Lord and uh, yeah, why, bring us up to today. Yeah, so I went back home and I threw it all away. I just said, I'm done. 
I don't want any more of that. I am totally done. And it's interesting, at the beginning of the year, they had, they had given us all prayer partners, and I remember thinking, well, whatever, I've got a prayer partner, you know? Um, and, uh, and it was a couple in the community that was going to be praying for you there at UCA. And about a month after I had this experience, I got a mail, something in the mail from this partner saying, about a month, you know, so sorry, I hadn't been praying for you at all, but about a month ago, I started, we just started, we just feel, felt like we needed to be praying for you. And we just started earnestly praying for you. And I looked at the date and everything, and it lined up, and I'm like, that was when I had that experience. So if the Lord is putting someone on your heart to pray for, pray for do them. it, do it. You know, lives change. And uh, so I, I wish I could say everything's been perfect. You know, that was 32 years ago kind of thing. Uh, I wish I could say everything was perfect since then. But the Lord has blessed. And I remember walking from that moment forward, not a perfect person, but joyful. And the Lord brought such a joy into my life. It was infectious. I couldn't help but share it with people around me. I remember, mm. I remember kind of coming to school the next day and looking for the group of guys that were kind of the, the guys that carried their Bible to class, you know, and this kind of thing, and kind of going, I don't even know how to talk to these guys. You know, you were one of those guys. You know? <laughs> I've known this guy a long time. Yeah. <laughs> and, okay. and there was a, this, this group, and so I kind of joined in with that group, and they, you know, kind of looked at me like, James? You know? <laughs> and, and, but they accepted me. And we had, in fact, I roomed with one of those guys, um, uh, the next year in college, and the Lord just blessed immensely. And I think the thing that I experienced was joy like I, I just couldn't even understand. And, you know, the Holy Spirit took me on a journey. I threw away my rock music, but there were other things that he needed to get rid of in my life. And as time would go on, he didn't burden me with a, a, a ton of things. He gave me, here, James, here's something. I want you to think about it. And I would think about that. And we would pray, to, I would pray uh, for, for deliverance and, and he would give me deliverance and we would just keep moving forward. And I think that's the journey of life. Mm -hmm. That's the journey of life. It's, you know, asking for the Holy Spirit, speak to me today, what can I surrender today? That's right. To take another step towards my best that's friend. Right. You know, and James, uh, the reality is if God were to hit us with all the things that he would, all, all at the same time, we, we'd fall over in a dead faint. There, there's no way that we could take it, take it. But, you know, God has been working so powerfully in your life. And, and I've, I, yes, I have known you for a while. And, and God is working in your life. And so thank and you so much well. for being vulnerable and being willing to share your journey. And, and like I said, friends, every person has a different story. But you know what? They're, they're all unique, and your story may not be James's story, but that's okay because God is working in your life, and we're so glad that you're here and you're watching tonight. Well, thank you, James, uh, for coming, and we are going to invite uh, uh, Dr. McKenzie. See, I get to say Dr. McKenzie, uh, to come forward and to share. Uh, Janice, we know her as Janice, and uh, so she's going to come and she's going to share... Um, how we can find freedom in our, uh, our physical life and, and uh, also um, the, the physical and the spiritual and how that all interacts. So I look forward to the message tonight. Thank you. Good evening. I think we're going to have some slides soon. So I just wanted to all, let you all know that the title of the talk this evening is Grow Stronger. And we'll be talking about some scientific and medical things. And I just want to let you know that even though he said, doctor, I'm not a medical doctor, I'm a doctor of philosophy. So you may not want to follow any specific advice I give it. This is just educational information, so don't consider it prescriptive in any sort of way. So just wanted to get that out there. 
And um, yeah, we should have slides soon. You know what? Let's go ahead and pray. Lord God, we are just so grateful for this opportunity that you've given us to come together and to discuss the challenges that we all have and ways, Lord, that you can help us to overcome them. We are so grateful for your goodness. We just ask that you would bless every person here and that you would speak to us through this talk. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I should have prayed for the PowerPoint. <laughs> okay, let's do that. Well, Lord God, we know that technology can sometimes be a challenge, but I pray, Lord, that you would help us out, figure out what's going on with the technology and help the PowerPoint to work. And we thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes, so I have confidence that the Lord is going to help us. Uh, earlier today, I was at the university, Walla Walla University, and we were using a big piece of equipment to pull pieces of metal apart in a materials class. And uh, that piece of equipment can be a little finicky sometimes. But you know what? The Lord helps us to use those, that technology, too, and those instruments, right? <laughs> so we're grateful for that. He always, he always helps us out. So, well, let's see. You know what? While we're waiting, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell you a little bit about my testimony, and that way um, we, can, we can kind of talk about some of these things that are familiar to us right now. So I can relate to James' testimony. Music was a really big thing for me as well. Um, I grew up in a home where my mother actually got one of those flyers on the door you can have free bible study or you can have bible studies and get a free bible as a result and so she did that and became an adventist and my dad never did so i i grew up in a divided home and so you know i had both influences there i had the wonderful music that we would play on friday nights when dad wasn't home and the sabbath was coming in um, but then of course dad had some of his influence too so so it was kind of back and forth, and when I got to be a teenager, I, uh, I did get involved with the wrong kind of music, right? Um, my mother, she ended up leaving my dad also when I was 14, and the reason was because he was um, trying to make me work on Sabbath. And so um, that was the reason, and she left him, and uh, there were some moral compromises in her life after that. And so I lived with her for a while, but I, I then went and lived with my dad. And so that's when I really started getting into the music. And that was just a really big thing for me. My dad would take me to concerts and so on. And, and uh, I really, really enjoyed that. And you know, what's interesting is I've never had a TV in my own house, but my dad, of course, had the TV. And so um, I did get into movies, go into movies with dad, that sort of thing as well. And so um, even though I'd been baptized, I did drift away from the Lord through some of these entertainment avenues. And, um, you know, sometimes I would even go to church. And I think sometimes we think we're okay, right? If we're going to church sometimes, you know, we do other things the rest of the time. And, and we think we're okay because we know the truth, right? We know the truth. And um, so that was my mindset for a while. And, you know, um, there would be some kind of back and forth, but, but really 
there finally came a point where I got back to where I had been when I got baptized, which was spending daily time with Jesus. You know, that's the key. And when you do that, all the other things that are interfering go away. Keep telling this. Okay. So, so, um, so anyway, um, really, really where I'm at now, the thing that I really like to do when I wake up in the morning is sing a little song to myself. I surrender all. You know, when I first wake up and my head's still on the pillow and I'm thinking about whether my nose is still cold or not, you know, some of those things because I've got my window wide open. And, um, I start singing, I surrender all to myself, you know, and that's just a good way to start my day, you know. And I just pray that the Lord will continue to show me, as, as James said, ways that I need to surrender more than what I have before, right? It continues to lead me in the way that I should go. And so I'm just so grateful for God's mercy and his grace. You know, he, he's just so gentle with us. And so patient and long-suffering. I'm just so grateful for the way that he's worked in my life. And also, I, um, I've actually got some people in my life that have really dealt with addictions that um, are pretty serious. You know, people have been to prison and jail. And, um, you know, there's been suicide attempts and things for people that I know. And so I spent quite a bit of my life in the prisons for prison ministry, right? And um, so it's, it's been really wonderful to, to really see how, um, how you can really get to the depths of a lot of difficult situations in your life and then have such a, a desire for the Lord, right? Such a desire. You know, some of the best worship services I've ever been in are in prisons, you know, because because you have this real um, transparency and honesty and this raw need for the Lord, right? You know that you can't do it yourself. A lot of us still think sometimes or a lot of the time that we can do it ourselves, right? Um, but some of those folks know better, right? They've, they've tried all of that and it didn't work. And so <clears throat> it can really be a powerful place to be in a prison and, and realizing that the Lord is just working in the lives of people that are there, regardless of, of where they've been, right? And um, one of their favorite songs, does anybody have a guess of what a favorite song would be? I don't know. Is anybody here involved in prison ministry right now? Yeah, um, I'm not either because I didn't take the COVID vaccination. And uh, at that time, that was um, a requirement. So I haven't, I haven't been doing prison ministry lately, although they did drop that requirement, and uh, I just haven't gone back to do it yet. Um, but anyway, does anybody have an idea of what their favorite song was? I, I, I mean, that the page was sometimes torn out of the book or just so worn out, it was their favorite song. That's a good one. They like that one. There's power in the blood. There's power in the blood. And we'll get to hear that song a little bit later. But you know, that's, that's a powerful song for me too. Is that powerful for you? Amen. You know, it doesn't take people in prison or um, in halfway houses or in homeless centers to need power in the blood. Does each one of us need that power? Amen. Yes, each one of us needs that that power in the blood. And that's the only thing that can save us, and that's the precious thing, isn't it? Amen. You know, one of these people that I know very well was, as I said, in and out of prison, drugs, suicide, all of that. And there were several suicide attempts. The last one was um, he was in a, I don't know if you guys haven't been to prison, I guess, but some of the times they'll have these pods where there's um, like a couple of stories and you have your little rooms on the top story and the stairs, and then there's the bottom story. And they all have a shower in that area. So just like a little group where they're all together, right? And of course, it's concrete floor in there. And so this, this person that I know actually jumped suicide attempt from the balcony onto the concrete floor below and landed like this. 
kind of, kind of in between the, the shoulder and the head. And um, yes. Put your file on here. Okay. When I had trouble on Monday, it was this little thing was the problem. Did he mess with this? I think he tried. I know. Anyway, sorry for that little interruption. Um, so anyway, he had done that, but he survived because of the way he hit. It was just probably one of the only ways that, that would have, he has sh shoulder trouble, but not much damage otherwise. But they put him in solitary confinement after that, right? To uh, keep him safe. And um, you know, he had tried a lot of the, a lot of the recovery programs. Um, his drug of choice was cocaine. And um, he had tried a lot of the, the different methods for recovery out there. And he had even gone to church and, you know, um, hung out with the people. And he knew how to talk Christian ease really well. Um, but when he was in that solitary cell, somebody wrote him a letter. And they knew that he was going through the motions, right? But he hadn't really surrendered. And they told him that. They said, you know, yeah. Yeah. you can go through the motions, but sometime you have to actually surrender. You have to actually come to the end of yourself. And when he was in that solitary confinement cell, after decades of coming in and out of prison and, and um, recovering and going back, that was when he finally gave up the cocaine. And he never went back. You know, there's power in the blood, but it really takes that surrender, doesn't it? Jesus has paid it all for us, but unless we really go through that process of surrender, um, then it's not going to make a difference, right? We can go through a lot of programs and different things, but it won't make a difference until we actually surrender. I apologize for um, the delay here, but I love the fact that we've got some competent people that know how to solve these problems. Um, yeah, so I was talking about power in the blood. Let's go ahead and sing that now. Are we on? So I'm going to be singing a medley that includes Power in the Blood. I'm going to start with one song, and then we're going to go into Power in the Blood. And on the chorus, I know it's really hard to be silent. So if you enjoy singing along, you're welcome to sing There is Power, Power, Wonder, Working Power with me while I'm singing along. <clears throat> Oh, 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 oh,
good to go now. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. All right. So we already talked about that. So I just wanted to let you know that my goals are to inspire you with science that aligns with biblical truth, to give you practical applications, and to lift up Jesus. Those are my goals. So the battle is for the mind. Do you believe that? You know, I heard that a long time ago, and it, it still resonates with me because I see it all the time. The battle is for the mind. You know, addictions weaken the frontal lobe. Does everybody know where the frontal lobe is? Oh, I need this one. Can you guys, can you all hear me? No? Let me do this one. Turn this one Okay, I'll use this mic. Should I turn off the other mic? Okay. All right, so addictions weaken the frontal lobe of our brain. And this progressively harms the way that we're able to use our frontal lobe, right? For decision making, for judgment, uh, for relationships, for making good decisions with relationships, um, short term goals and long term goals. We just have trouble really processing these things when we're under the power of addictions. Um, and actually, during cravings, the frontal lobe shuts down entirely. So here we can see there's four pictures across the top of the screen, and there's four pictures across the bottom of the screen. And of course, these are brain scans. These are done with um, glucose sensitivity. So basically the yellow areas that are lighted up are showing you where the most active areas of the brain are because they are uptaking the glucose. And so on the top that you can see there is a normal subject. And then on the bottom you can see there's a cocaine abuser. And you can see that the frontal lobe is impaired in the cocaine abuser. And so that's basically what addictions will do to us. They will shut down our frontal lobe. So this frontal lobe damage, you know, we have trouble. I'm a professor, and so these things uh, do concern me when, when the frontal lobe isn't working well because people don't have good attention and they t can't concentrate. They can't solve complex problems, right? I work in the School of Engineering, so that's an important thing for us. Um, they have difficulty with language, slower critical thinking, social behaviors. So their social behaviors change. This is a good uh, cue if you know somebody and their, their behavior starts to change socially that something is going on, right? Impatience and intolerance of others. So um, kind of a downward spiral in relationships, verbal and physical outbursts, and ego centricity. Okay, so those are all in indicators of frontal lobe damage. You know, there's, there's another list here, and I'm going to go through this one as well, because I think it's important for us to really think about if we have some frontal lobe damage from things that we're doing, or if others around us do. And we're going to talk about some addictions that should hit home to, for most of us. Um, poor judgment and lack of inhibition impulsive, dangerous behaviors. Negativity. Negativity is a sign that our frontal lobe is damaged. Apathy, not caring about things. Rigidity and inflexibility, not really being able to um, adapt. Risky behavior, which is certainly addictive behavior. A lack of empathy, not really being able to understand what other people are going through not being motivated, and then depression and anxiety, right? So those are all signs of frontal lobe damage. Now, um, sometimes we tend to think, well, you know, I've got this problem or that problem, but it's because I inherited it. My uncle was that way and my grandma was that way, and that's just the way I am, right? That's what we tend to think a lot of times. And certainly there are some things that we get genetically from our relatives. <clears throat> there was a, a Danish twin study, 
and they established that only about 20% of an average person, their life is dictated by their genes. So a lot of what our lives come out to be is our choices, right? And so um, the genes do factor in, but not as strongly as we sometimes think they do. So we are here during this summit to talk about being set free. So what can we be set free from? Well, I think we all know that there's drugs. Um, we've talked about things like cocaine and heroin. There's marijuana, which is very popular these days. Um, but then there's things that are a little more socially acceptable and even acceptable in a lot of churches, such as alcohol, nicotine, and caffeine. And by the way, I wanna pause here for just a second and these drugs actually, the more you take one of them, the more it encourages the use of the others of them. So for instance, if you're trying to give up nicotine but you're drinking a lot of coffee, it's gonna be a lot harder for you because those two in encourage each other's use, right? So really giving them all up is helpful in those cases. Um, <clears throat> food, so sugar. How many people have liked sugar at some point in their life, even if it's not right now? <laughs> so sugar, desserts, that's really popular. But you know, sugar hits the brain very similarly to cocaine. And actually, cheesecake, a lot of people like cheesecake, right? There's a lot of fat in cheesecake, fat and sugar. And that, that is a very addictive su substance. So sugar and of course refined flours are similar to sugar um, and fat and things like chocolate. So there are foods that can really affect us in very similar ways to drugs. So we wanna be set free from these things. And we've talked about some of these entertainment situations too. I never had a television addiction in my life, but I certainly did have a, mu a movie addiction, right? I've never played a video game that I know of, um, but I was addicted to music. So, so there are, and music that wasn't helpful, right? There's different kinds of music, um, certainly, but um, I was addicted to the kinds of music that weren't good for me. Things like classical music and hymns are great, great kinds of music, but that wasn't what I was listening to. Um, social media can be very addictive. YouTube, a lot of my students really like YouTube. Um, sports, pornography, and then worldly reading material. We talked about that a little last night, and I've certainly um, fallen into some of those traps too. Even just reading for me adventure stories about people climbing mountains and things like that um, can be addictive, right? Can be something that we can spend our time in better ways. Um, so negative thinking, emotions, and behaviors. Um, these are all things that can be addictive, right? We can be very addicted to kind of getting into a rut and staying in that rut. Um, and fear, anxiety, and depression are things that can result, and we can actually be set free from these. So here's what I'd like you to know. We can reverse the damage. With addictions, the thing is you can never get enough of what you don't need. However, we can reverse the damage from addictions. In alcoholism, abstinence results in bursts of neurogenesis and brain regrowth. What do you think about that? Yes, so, and that's, that's just one example. Um, there's many examples. So even though I showed you those brain scans, the minute you stop doing something, your body, God designed it to heal, right? God designed it to regenerate and to heal. <clears throat> so we're not going to spend a long time on this slide because I know it's probably hard for you to see everything that's on there. But what I really want you to see here is the blue is dopamine pathways and the red is serotonin pathways. Those are two common neurotransmitters. Have you all heard of these? Yes. So those two neurotransmitters are what help us to, in the right levels, they help us to have balanced moods and, and um, appropriate uh, rewards from, from good activities in our life. However, they can be out of balance as well, right? So if we don't have enough serotonin, we might not, um, might not be in a very happy mood. And if we don't have enough dopamine, we might not be very motivated to do the things that we should do. 
And so dopamine, I want you to notice, is primarily in what part of the, the brain? Where's the blue primarily? In the frontal lobe. Okay, so that's important for us to know. Okay, so speaking of this reward circuit then, um, you know we've talked about drugs, but what our brains really want is love, right? What they really want is love. Um, we talked about sugar and cocaine, but love will cause healthy amounts of dopamine to be released. Healthy amounts of dopamine. So, you know, <clears throat> we've heard about looking for love in all the wrong places, and that's something we can certainly do. Um, with drugs and so on. But you know, the Lord is the source of all love, and he wants to give us that love that will really supplant all those desires for other addictions in our life, even sometimes relationships that aren't good for us. Um, however, drugs overstimulate that reward system, and that dopamine can shut down the frontal lobe. Um, so there is something that we're going to talk about a little later that I'll introduce now, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, that's BDNF. It is what you want to remember. That is fertilizer for the brain. It helps neurons to grow new neurons. It also helps your neurons to make more connections. And so that increases your learning, memory, and problem solving. Um, but unfortunately, that is decreased with drugs. We'll talk later on about how to increase that. All right, so the prefrontal cortex, we said that is really important, um, really important in judging what should be happening in our life and making good, solid decisions. Um, but sometimes we can make decisions out of our emotions, right? Instead of uh, taking into account all of the, the things we should be thinking about, we can just make our decisions based on emotions. And, you know, that might have been what James was talking about a little bit, too, when we're just filling our minds with all this entertainment. We don't really think about what we're doing. We just kind of go with the flow, right? And so here we can see that we have this area called the anterior cingulate, cingulate cortex, right? So you've got the, whoops, wrong button, sorry. So you've got the prefrontal cortex in pink there, and then in yellow you have the the, an, the um, anterior cingulate cortex. And then you'll notice that kind of in the middle of the brain you have the amygdala. So, so really it's that prefrontal cortex that's, that we should be using to make our decisions and the anterior cingulate cortex is kind of in between that and the amygdala. And the amygdala is where we're making emotional decisions. And it's usually the kind of decisions that results in rage and, and behaviors that are not good. Um, and so are we making decisions with our prefrontal cortex or our amygdala? And is our anterior cingulate um, cortex helping us to kind of mediate between those two areas of the brain? That anterior cingulate cortex is really our neurological heart. And um, so it helps us to feel empathy. It helps us to choose between right and wrong. It helps us to choose to love. It helps us to decide whether relationships are good for us. And it helps us to want to serve other people, right? To want to um, volunteer and reach out and help other people. So in our prefrontal, prefrontal cortex, we learn by theory, and in our amygdala, we learn by feeling. And it's important for our anterior cingulate cortex to mediate between those two. Okay, so since we started talking about emotions, we, you can see here that someone is feeling a lot of fear, and sometimes fear really drives our behaviors. And so, Sometimes we'll have these emotional feelings and memories, and, and really um, these are interactions between our prefrontal cortex and, as we said, the amygdala area, the diencephalon. But our prefrontal cortex is our judgment, our control over expression and emotions, and then our feelings come from the amygdala. So here's what this looks like. Um, again, those sections of the brain, and we see that, that crossover area 
the anterior cingulate cortex, there was a paper published that said the anterior, entitled The Anterior Cingulate Cortex in Hope and Optimism. And you can see the authors there, um, Phelps and um, Drevitz. And basically, they said in their paper that um, if you have optimism and hope that you show re increased responses in the ACC area of your brain and decreased responses in the amygdala. So that's really what we want to see. And so what do some of these characteristics look like if you're in the limbic, in the middle of your brain, in the amygdala area, or if you're in the cortex area? What do those different emotions look like? So in the limbic, we would see things like fear and insecurity. Again, that prefrontal cortex was shut down like we talked about earlier. Selfishness, uh, rage, lust, jealousy, envy, and aggression, right? So characteristics that we really don't like to see in ourselves or in others. However, if we are focused on the prefrontal cortex and making it healthy and avoiding addictions, we can learn how to have healthy love, how to have compassion for others, how to have altruism or, or selfless service for other people, and we can, our, reasoning impact, our reasoning capacity increases. Um, we have empathy, we can plan, and we have um, morality and judgment and conscientiousness. And so really this prefrontal cortex is what we want to focus on. So one of the things that will help you determine where you're at between these two is, are you a victim of instant gratification? There was a study years ago where they tested little children with a marshmallow, how long they could wait before eating the marshmallow. And they followed these children through and their lives and really factors of all kinds of success and relationships and career and, and so on were dependent on how likely they were to want to instantly gratify themselves or how, able, how they were able to put off that instant gratification. So that's something maybe you can think about. You know, when I have an impulse or a temptation, do I just go do it or can I put it off? If I'm really hungry and, and I know mealtime isn't for two hours, can I not wait? Do I have to go snack or, or do I go eat? You know, different things like that to test yourself on whether you're a victim of instant gratification. So, what kind of things bypass the prefrontal cortex? Well, you know, there are, we've all heard of hypnotism, right? That's not a, bit, not a common word anymore, but I was, when I was little, that was a pretty big um, deal. There was a lot of hypnotism type of things going on. But today we don't hear about it much, and I think the reason is because a lot of the things in our society are predisposed to hypnotize us, and we don't even know it. Hypnotizing means that you just um, are you're, you let go of your ability to make decisions, and you do you fall under the power of someone else's mind, right? And so music and lyrics, music just enters your ears, and you don't even say yes or no, right? If you're in the room where music is, it goes into your mind, right? So you're, you're, you're hearing the beats, or your, your, your body is reverberating with the beats. I've had my heart change beats because of music that I was, that was experiencing in the location I was. And so, and the lyrics go right in there. Um, fear, fear bypasses the prefrontal cortex. We talked about that with the amygdala system. Um, alcohol and drugs. Um, shut that down. And some people are into meditation techniques, Eastern meditation techniques. Those will bypass the frontal lobe as well. You do chants for those. Um, entertainment style television and movies. How many people know that these are hypnotic? Yeah, they have these quick scene changes, right? Just a few seconds or even sometimes parts of a second. And if you ever see somebody watching TV or movies and you're not doing it at that time, you, you haven't been doing it, and you start to count how long till a scene change. It's shocking. It really is quick. And then we've got these little kids in front of the, the TV sets, you know, and so we, we know what's happening to their brains. Actually, in France, I don't know if it's still the case, they had 
they had said that TV wasn't good for, in that country. TV wasn't good for kids up to at least 18 months of age because they knew that um, this harms the developing brain. And of course, video games. Video games do the same. So we have to ask ourselves, what part of the brain are we strengthening? Are we strengthening the prefrontal cortex or the amygdala? Well, there's this great quote that probably a lot of us know. Ministry of Healing says there's some things that we can all do that are going to help us to strengthen that frontal cortex. That is the part of our brain that communicates with God. So it's really important that we have a frontal cortex, prefrontal cortex, that is working well. So pure air, sunlight, abstemiousness, rest, exercise, proper diet, the use of water and trust in divine power. These are the true remedies. Every person should have a knowledge of nature's remedial agencies and how to apply them. So with that in mind, uh, someone from Village Church that's named Aletha Gruzinski has uh, presented these kinds of principles in programs in the community, and I've done some community programs presenting these principles as well. So we got together to put together a program called Grow Stronger. Now this program was actually supposed to start this coming Sunday evening, but Aletha has um, had to have a, an emergency surgery basically on her ankle. So you can lift her up in prayer and stay tuned. We will let you know when this program happens. But basically it's strategies for rising above depression, anxiety, and trauma, but really any lifestyle issue that you may have. And so Grow Stronger st stands for gratitude, rest, optimize thinking and emotional intelligence, water, sunlight, trust in God and integrity, relationships, social support and forgiveness, outdoors and fresh air, nutrition, giving and volunteering, exercise, and then resilience. Grow stronger. How many of you want to grow stronger? Amen. And I think these are principles that we can all apply in our lives. So let's talk about these briefly. So gratitude. Gratitude is really a good thing. Gratitude improves your attitude and your ability to cope with stress and reduce depression. Um, so one thing that really has helped, actually Glenn Kuhn talked about this, and we're going to have people in our program do this. Um, when you get up in the morning, make five cards. It can be uh, recipe cards, or maybe a, something a little smaller than that, about that size, and write down on those five cards five things you're grateful for. And this helps because you're actually thinking about it, you're writing it down, and you're holding it in your hand. You're using a lot of different ways of connecting with them. And that does make a difference. And then what you do additionally is you say it out loud and you hear it. The more senses we can involve in this experience, the stronger of an impact it has on us, right? And so you might think, well, that's, that's crazy. I'm a grateful person. I don't need to do this. But it really does work. So try it. And if you know somebody that's struggling a little bit, ask them to try it. And I believe it's going to make a big difference. You, so you say these five things out loud as often as you can throughout the day. And of course, if somebody's around, maybe you want to say it under your breath. But, the, but if you can hear it, it's going to help you remember it, and it's going to have more, an impact on, more of an impact on you. And then right before you go to bed, you want to read them once more before you go to bed. Now, it's good to make new note cards every day, right? So if you can make new note cards every day, try this for just a couple of weeks and see if it helps. And if it really helps, you may want to continue doing that or maybe at least keep a gratitude journal. So Thanksgiving and gratitude. Thanksgiving and gratitude improve happiness and joy. The more you write out or think about or pray about. What I like to do is thank God first thing in the morning for who he is, for um, the people in my life, and for the things that he's doing in my life. I that's what I like to do every morning. Um, 
but I, that makes us joyful. They've done research on this. Healthcare workers um, responded well to um, having to write out gratitudes instead of grudges, right? They did a lot better with the stress and depression when they were writing out gratitudes instead of grudges. So it improves happiness, quality, and quantity of relationships, their cardiovascular health, sleep, Self-care, just taking good care of yourself, right? Um, making sure that you keep your oral hygiene up and all of the different things that we need to do to take care of ourselves. Um, I do, again, teach in engineering, and there's a lot of students there. A lot of them are males, and we do have to talk about things like that because when you're really busy with school, self-care can sometimes slip. Um, so empathy, thanksgiving and gratitude improve empathy and self-respect. And they decrease the things that we want to have decreased, right? Depression and suicide, pain, headaches, um, gastrointestinal problems, respiratory infections. Of course, we've just had about with COVID and a lot of people had manifestations in their respiratory tract. Aggression and post-traumatic stress disorder. So, some really great reasons to be grateful. And it's good to tell other people what you're grateful for and that you're grateful for them when you are. The Ministry of Healing, page 251, says, nothing tends more to promote health of body and of soul than does a spirit of gratitude and praise. It is a positive duty to resist melancholy, discontented thoughts and feelings as much a duty as it is to pray. So rest, how many of you want really good rest? And rest isn't just sleep, is it? I mean, rest is sleep, but it's more than sleep, right? Some people stay up late trying to get their rest before they sleep. You know what I'm talking about? Kind of unwind and, and so on. So rest is really important. Um, and of course, addictions are associated with with poor quality sleep. That may not be the only reason they would have poor quality sleep, but that certainly um, is a part of addictive behavior. Now, so what's the idea? What do we want to do? We want to shoot for seven to eight hours a night, and we want to sleep during the early part of the evening because then our melatonin cycle is better. And melatonin is a cousin of serotonin in the brain. It's a great antioxidant hormone, and it's released more earlier on. But if we're in the lights, we don't really get the good melatonin release, and um, it's not as ideal. Our sleep won't be as ideal. So what's interesting is uh, there's a paper that studied the pre-industrial humans from three different areas, and they found that they went to bed about three hours after sundown, and they rose before dawn, right? So I thought that was really interesting. Um, and that really matches well with what our circadian rhythm should be, right? We get really off base with some of our electronics and TV programming that goes late into the night and wanting to get stuff done, whatever it is. But um, certainly kind of going back to how people lived maybe before technology and electricity is helpful. Okay, so optimize thinking. So certainly the way we think is going to be indicative of who we are as a person, right? And one of the qualities that, that we can see about a person is their emotional intelligence, how they, how they manage their emotions and how they relate to the emotions of other people, right? And how they handle other people. Emotional intelligence is what companies are looking for when they hire people. So they want people that can have optimal thinking and we can all improve our emotional intelligence. One of the easiest ways to do that is to eliminate, and I did say eliminate, negative thinking. Does anybody in here think that's possible? <laughs> yes, it is possible. In fact, I challenge you to two weeks, two weeks. See if you can go two weeks without thinking negatively. And if you have a negative th thought, start over with the two weeks. Just see if you can do that. I challenge you. Um, it's a good challenge, and, and I think you'll be very rewarded by how your whole 
demeanor and attitude about a lot of things change if you try this. We can actually replace negative, distorted thoughts with truthful thoughts. Research has shown that negative thoughts are almost always distorted. So, how do we have distorted thoughts? And how would you know if you have distorted thoughts, right? Um, because we usually think what we think is correct. So, distorted thoughts. So, perception is the way that we understand things, and all of us in this room are gonna perceive things just a little bit differently. But reality is the truth and the way things actually are, right? So there can be a real disconnect between perception and reality. And that's what happens with distorted thinking. And the more we can bring those two together, make our perceptions the same as reality, then we're gonna have higher emotional intelligence and we're gonna have a lot more positive thinking patterns. And so this can be a little bit difficult for us to identify sometimes, although I'm pretty sure if you ask the people around you, they will tell you how much distorted thinking they think you have going on. So people around us tend to know um, if we're thinking in distorted ways or not. So why is this important? Well, it's important because our thoughts influence our feelings and our feelings influence our behaviors. And does anybody else know the end of that statement? And our behaviors influence our, our character. And our character, our destiny. destiny. So is this important? Do you think those negative thoughts might lead to a negative destiny? That's something to think about, isn't it? Yeah, so sometimes we, we like to stay in our little, our little ruts of negative thinking. Sometimes we feel sorry for ourselves or, or whatever, and it kind of feels good to stay in that rut, but it's really not good for us. And so the sooner we can jump out of that rut, the better. There is a whole, um, a whole therapy technique out there called cognitive behavioral therapy where they help people to recognize distorted thoughts and to think true and positive thoughts. But this is something that we can all work on ourselves as well, even though there are trained therapists out there that do that. So, you know, a scripture that I really like is Philippians 4. This is one of my favorite all-time scriptures. It says, be careful or anxious for nothing. But in how many things? In everything, by prayer and supplication with what? With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the what? Peace. Peace of God, which passes all, underst all understanding, shall guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Do you want your hearts and minds guarded? That's going to go a long way, isn't it, towards all the things we're talking about with addictive behaviors and overcoming those, guarding our hearts and minds. And here, we were just talking about not thinking negative thoughts. Philippians 4.8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue or any praise, do what? Think on these things. So the reason for this is because there's an enemy and he can put thoughts in your mind. I saw a bumper sticker once and it's probably the most poignant bum bumper sticker I've ever seen. It said, don't believe everything you think. <laughs> Why did it say that? Because I have an enemy that's putting thoughts into my mind. I have the Lord that's trying to draw me and put his thoughts in my mind too right? But I need to analyze those thoughts. Lord, is that from you? Right? Is that your still small voice? Or that's just not a thought I should think and to cast it down, right? We can cast down those thoughts and imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. The Bible tells us to be sober and vigilant for our enemy is walking around as a roaring lion. So here's just another um, example of your thoughts 
and your behaviors and your feelings affect each other. And that can even, that can even affect your physical health. Um, there is a quote in the Spirit of Prophecy that says that over 90% of physical ailments have their source in the mind. And so our thoughts may influence the physical health, the reasons that we're going to the doctor. So something to keep in mind. So water, water, we are mostly water, right? How much water is in your brain? A lot more than it's in your bones. Yeah, so we've got 60 to 70%, depending upon how old we are and some other things. But um, our brain is largely water, it's a soft tissue. So drinking water is going to help your brain a lot. So figure out your body weight and drink half of that at least every day, right? in ounces. I'm sorry, I forgot to put ounces. So if you weigh 150 pounds, how many ounces are you going to drink? 75 ounces. How many quarts is that? It's a little over two quarts, isn't it? Two and a half. That should do it. Um, and of course, if you exercise or, or get hot, then you would want to drink more. And that's conservative, by the way. So um, definitely get your water. So dehydration, I think a lot of times we're dehydrated and we don't know it. That certainly is a problem in America. And I think even in uh, Christian circles and in health communities, we don't really, maybe we get too busy or whatever, but I think a lot of times we're dehydrated and we might be a little moody because of that, right? Um, we might have a little reduced cognitive function, right? If I haven't drunk, if I haven't dr drunk, drank, drunk, drunk any water <laughs> for my whole lab, which was three hours, my brain probably isn't going to be working as well at the end of the lab, right? Um, so cognitive functioning, uh, concentration, increases irritability. So sometimes we feel a little irritable, maybe it's just that we're dehydrated. Certainly headaches. If you have a headache or a migraine, which is a more serious version of a headache, always think, how much water have I had? That should be the first thought that comes to mind. All right, so sunlight. I did see some sun. Did you all see some sun? So Walla Walla isn't the sunniest place in the winter. We have great sun in the summer. Uh, so sunlight is good for us, and we should definitely get as much of it as we can. Um, it's so good for us. Infrared light from the sun actually can reduce symptoms of depression and anxiety, and really, if you look through the whole gamut of, of benefits, health benefits, um, infrared light can produce those. We can get some lights in our house that are infrared. We can find heaters that are infrared. So in the winter, that might be one of the ways that we can replace some of the effects from the sun that we like. And of course, vitamin D uh, is, a, is a good reason to be out in the sunlight. And then actually it impro improves your mood. You actually produce a lot of melatonin and serotonin from the sunlight. So again, this is just for educational purposes, but a lot of people, especially in this latitude, need to take up to 10,000 IU of vitamin D a day. And that may be all year long, even in the summer. So get your vitamin D levels checked. Um, in the winter, a blue light box can really help with people that suffer from seasonal anxiety depressive disorder, right? So a, a blue light box or a white light, white light box, that is 10,000 lux, and then you, you just put that kind of off to the side a little bit while you're having your devotions in the morning and um, just a, a little bit away from your face like this and, and 20 to 40 minutes depending on the box and, and how long you've been using it. And if you're struggling with depression and anxiety, another dose in the afternoon around 3 o'clock can be really helpful. Or if you're having sleep problems, uh, that can be helpful as well. So trust in God and integrity. Do you think these two have anything to do with each other? You know, the people that are the closest to God are the people that have the highest integrity that I know. I think these two are directly correlated, right? And I can think of no character trait that is more appealing than integrity, right? It's somebody that you, you can just go to and just trust them. They're going to be, they're going to be firm, reliable, helpful, um, 
kind. It's just, it's a, it's a good character trait to have. And I think the closer that we get to God, we'll have more integrity in our life. You know, God is the one that can make all these things that we're talking about possible. It's really about connecting with him and staying connected with him. Because if I'm trying to overcome an addiction, or if I'm trying to just get done what I need to get done, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Is that right? So that's in Philippians 4.13, 2 Peter 1.3. You know, I really love 2 Peter uh, 1, the first part there. That was uh, apparently Ellen White's favorite passage as well, and it certainly is one of mine. Verse 3 says, According as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. And then down in verse 10, there's a very interesting text, and I've meditated on this. Brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure, for if we do these things, you shall what? You shall never fall. That is what it says. That's pretty exciting. That's a good promise, isn't it? So you'll want to look at what at what Second uh, Peter one says, one ten says before that. But I wanted to bring that text up to you because I think that's really helpful as we're we're aiming for victory and overcoming. So, let's see, yeah. So, you know, there is a group of or several groups of people around the world that are blue zones. They've been studied by National Geographic to have long lives. Um, and they, they surveyed 263 people that were 100 years old or more, and all but five of them belong to faith-based communities. Do you think that's helpful? Absolutely. Absolutely, it's helpful. So they found that attending faith-based services four times per month will add four to 14 years of life expectancy. Um, so let's talk about relationships. Are there any loners out there? Any people that are hermits that kind of want to be off by themselves and not really interact with others? Some of us tend to be more that way, right, introverts. And also when we're struggling with addictions, what's one of the symptoms of addiction? It's isolation. It's isolation. Uh, so really... What helps a lot with addictions or anything else in our life is having a social support network, having solid relationships in our life. And, and, you know, there may be some people thinking, you know, I just don't have people like that in my life. I don't have anyone I can trust. Nobody likes me. You know, that may be the situation you're in. And one of our other things we're going to talk about is serving other people and volunteering and really, as you reach out to other people, I guarantee you, you will develop relationships and develop that social network. So if you don't have it now, reach out to other people. See if you can help someone else, and that will help to build that social network, and it'll help you to feel a lot better, too. So healthier relationships, something we could probably all work on. Improved, uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I skipped something here. So forgiveness helps us. Um, by helping our relationships, right? All of us need to forgive other people. So I think a lot of the problems that people have with mental health, um, addictions, stress, um, depression, anxiety, is because there's unforgiveness in our hearts, right? So maybe it's back to the parents. Maybe our parents did something to us and it still bothers us. Maybe we were bullied at some point in our life. Um, you know, there's just a number of things that could have happened through our life. And sometimes, again, it kind of feels good for some reason to, to, to think about, to, to kind of ruminate on those things and to keep thinking about them. But you know what? There is no peace in that. But there is peace in forgiveness. Not just for you, but for the other person, but really mostly for you. We think that we're uh, harming the other person by not forgiving them. We're harming ourselves more. So let's forgive. That leads to healthier relationships, improved mental health, um, less anxiety, stress, and hostility, fewer symptoms of depression, even lower blood pressure, and a stronger immune system. 
So let's forgive. That will certainly help our relationships. I know that's worked for me. I've had some relationships in my life where I've exercised forgiveness and seen some really excellent results. Um, so, so as we're talking about relationships, they did a study with rats. And so they had rats, and they were able to either drink heroin-laced water or regular water, right? And some of the rats were socially isolated, and some of them were in social groups. Now, the rats that were socially isolated chose the heroin water and killed themselves. But the rats that were in social groups chose the pure water and did not become addicted or kill themselves. Um, so that, that's very interesting. And even addicted rats, when they moved them into the social setting, they would stop drinking the heroin-laced water. So social context is really important for drug addictions. For rats, you say, well, what about humans? Actually, it turns out that it's the same is true for humans. Um, in Vietnam, 20% of soldiers were heroin addicts but 95% of them stopped when they returned home. In Portugal, they have 1% heroin addicts, but they made a new program where they put them on house arrest rather than jail, and the heroin um, usage went down by 50%. So we see here that those social networks really do help with addictions. First John 4.18 says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Patriarchs and Prophets 534 says, we are all woven together in the great web of humanity. And whatever we can do to benefit and uplift others will reflect in blessing upon ourselves. The law of mutual dependence runs through all classes of society. Outdoors and fresh air. How many of you like getting outdoors? How about in this weather though? It's still fun, isn't it? Have any of you gone out there and kind of, I mean, I don't, I don't say I'm recommending this, but I find it kind of fun to go out there and slip and slide a little bit as long as I can remain upright and, and just get the fresh air and, and smell the trees. There's this one tree that I pass on my route that I just love. I should just stand under that tree. It's, it's amazing. So it's good to get outside, right? Research shows that spending time in nature protects against depression, against diabetes, Diabetes, right? Obesity, ADHD, cardiovascular disease, and cancer. And so when people go outside, especially if they're able to get into a green space or into a forested area, that's even better, right? There's a lot of research on this. Um, so this is just a little bit of a summary on it. Um, you can have reduced ADHD, stress, depression and anxiety, and increase your immune function. All, all kinds of your immune cells just kind of get all activated and uh, do a better job when you've been outside, especially in the greenery, and your mood increases as well. Um, so nutrition is really, I know that I love this picture. Um, nutrition is really important for optimal health and for optimal mental health, especially as we're trying to work on overcoming habits. The plant-based diet improves mental health, and that's been proven in many, many studies. Um, but even just a single meal of fruits and vegetables or a single bout of exercise can increase your mood. Um, folates, which are in beans and vegetables, alleviates depression. And your psychological health is correlated to your physical health. Happy people just get sick less often. It's kind of what we were saying a little while ago. Okay, so let's talk briefly about these neurotransmitters just a little more. So we already mentioned serotonin and dopamine. They are very important for mood and for motivation and things like that. But there's also norepinephrine. Norepinephrine is going to help you with energy and alertness. And so you say, but I can't do anything about my neurotransmitters, or I've been told that I have um, some mental health challenges, and so my neurotransmitters are never going to be right. Well, actually, there's things we can do about our neurotransmitters. Um, so one of the things that we can do is take 
flax seed or chia seed. Um, up to four tablespoons of flax seed and or chia seed a day. They actually contain some amino acids that help us to make dopamine and serotonin. Tryptophan and tyrosine, they also contain omega-3s. And omega-3s are powerful for mental health, cardiovascular health, and all kinds of health. So um, if I was going to recommend for anybody to, um, to take anything that could help them, it would be the three things that I've got on this slide because they're all so powerful in our bodies. There's so much research out there on these. So um, do some research if you're not taking any of these three things. Uh, we talked about the vitamin D and curcumin, which is turmeric. So I should have actually said turmeric there. One to two teaspoons of, of turmeric per day and the active ingredient there is curcumin. So those are really helpful for mental and overall health. Um, we talked a little bit already about giving, volunteering, and service. I have actually seen this really help people. They have done research and altruism is the thing that actually makes people happy, right? It's not the car, the kids, the home, the marriage. It's not all the things that tend to be popular uh, for people to think, or even entertainment, right? None of those things actually makes people happy in, in the study that they've done. It's actually altruism that makes people happy. And, it, and it's actually a therapy for overcoming addictions. It's a very proven and uh, good therapy to use. Exercise, I think we all know exercise is good for us. We talked a little bit ago about brain-derived neurotrophic factor. It's the fertilizer for the brain, and it increases during exercise and fasting, during a number of healthy things that we can do. Sunlight, good quality sleep, and social enrichment also increase our BDNF levels. Um, but exercise is one of the best ones. So getting out there and really getting your heart rate moving and sweating a little bit, that's going to help a lot. Um, exercise increases your mood and motivation. Actually, muscle mass, so if you're doing resistance exercises, that is correlated to brain mass. Muscle mass is correlated to brain mass. So I don't know about you, but that's pretty motivating to do some push-ups and pick up some dumbbells, right? Or, or whatever you can. There's things we can do in chairs, just sitting in chairs, right, with, with uh, cans of fruit and vegetables or some of those rubber band things. Um, there's lots that we can do. So get 30 minutes of sweaty exercise a day if you can, and exercise after meals to help regulate your blood glucose. Finally, we get to resilience, grow stronger. That is the last R in resilience. So resilience is a word we don't use a lot, but it's, it's uh, gaining a lot of attention because <clears throat> you've probably all heard there's people that have experienced trauma in their lives, and sometimes that leads to addictive behaviors. But you know what's interesting? There's other people that have experienced just as much trauma as some that turn to addictive behaviors, but they don't turn to those behaviors. And they have a characteristic called resilience. So the definition by the American Psychological Association is that it's the process and outcome of successfully adapting to difficult or challenging life experiences, especially through mental, emotional, and behavioral, and behavioral flexibility and adjustment to external and internal demands. It really is the key to overcoming addictions in terms of, of the, the way the APA would speak. But we know that God's the one that gives us that resilience, right? Um, it's a little more innate for some people, but Jesus is the answer for all of the things that we struggle with. So as, in summary, we want to activate our frontal lobe, not our limbic system. We want to serve others, especially the less fortunate. Um, Bible study and Bible meditation is one of the best things that we can do um, for our time with God and for our mind, a thoughtful hour a day is what I would recommend. To get good exercise is helpful. Um, to get good sleep and to help our brain detox by, by being healthy with our water and our nutrition choices. Um, getting outside into fresh air and sunshine and avoiding um, substances that aren't good for us and in moderation using those substances that are. We want to avoid suppressing our frontal load, and we want to have 
healthy social circles, and we want to get rid of that negative and distorted thinking. How, how long are we going to get rid of our negative thinking for again? Two weeks. Two weeks. How many of you will agree to do that? Okay, I saw the hands. That's good. That was a good response. All right, well, thank you so much for your patience and attention. Let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we are just so grateful for the way that you've created us. We are grateful for the principles that you have taught us that show us how to live better. And Lord, we know that all of us could do better than what we're doing. And I ask that tonight, as we consider these things, that each of us would receive the convictions of the Holy Spirit as you are trying to lead us in paths that are better for us whether to overcome things that we're struggling with, Lord, or to pick up healthy behaviors. I pray that we would allow you to work in us. And Lord, we thank you. We thank you for the blood of Jesus that saves us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much, uh, Janice, for that wonderful presentation. And thank you this evening for coming out. Uh, just want to mention again uh, that uh, we will uh, be having a prayer afterwards uh, for those who would like to come forward. Uh, just feel a special need for a prayer. Or if you would like to talk to um, Janice McKenzie, you can come down to the front as well. Uh, a reminder again, tomorrow night, uh, uh, Rob Knott is going to be sharing, and so I just uh, I encourage you to come and to uh, listen to what he has to say about media addictions. Uh, this is a huge area that is affecting many people uh, in our society, and it's growing, and it's getting uh, more and more dark. And so if uh, you know of someone that, uh, that, that uh, could benefit from uh, Rob Knott's presentation, please invite them. Uh, get on your social media. <laughs> Use social media against social media. There you go. And uh, so come tomorrow evening. And so thank you so much for coming out this evening. God bless. Good night. Hello friend, my name is James Ash and I want to personally thank you for watching our program today. If you would like to see more videos just like this, all you have to do is go to statelineadventmedia.org and you can watch to your heart's content. And oh, by the way, don't forget to click the like, share, and subscribe buttons on each one of our various platforms. Because you see, my friend, this helps us reach more people with the good news of Jesus' soon return. Ministries like this require large teams of people. You would be amazed if you were to see how many people are required to produce each one of our programs. And if you would like to join with us by becoming a ministry partner, you can actually help us reach the unreached with the gospel. All you have to do is go to statelineadventmedia.org slash donate and you can give us a much needed boost most importantly of all friend we need your prayers i assure you that the devil does not like this ministry and your prayers are what protect and direct what we do here once again thank you from the bottom of our hearts <laughs>